Hi, I'm Dave. What I've got here are some clips and some instruments, and all I want to do is perform a little bit with them using Bitwig to take the clips and turn them into something else. It's one thing to perform and have a ton of things set up. It's another thing to have just a few clips that actually evolve and change over time. Uh, we're gonna look at a couple things. Some uh, operators that are in Bitwig that control when audio or notes do play or don't play, which is interesting. But maybe we'll just start a little bit uh, in a patch over here with the grid, which is our virtual sound design environment, our modular environment. So, just to make one fun point. When a system is really, truly polyphonic, what's interesting is when I play the notes can actually control the entire rhythm. I was playing all those notes together, but now if I break them up in time a little bit, So, there are some different opportunities there, whether I want to make this, maybe. <laughs> Why would you make it so clicky? Well, maybe over on my aux. have some notes and again like we said the timing of them is going to determine the rhythm that's happening between them So that's something a little bit playful to begin with. And if I'm trying to do performance, I'm just trying to get something a little bit playful that changes a little bit each time. So maybe if we take some basic, very basic drums on top of that, super basic. My loop is one bar long, which is exciting to me because it fits on the screen. That's what's exciting about a one bar loop. And I want to work that way. So let's take a look at these operators that were mentioned a minute ago. I've got this snare drum, it is hitting. It is hitting once, it is hitting hard. And if I look over in the corner, I've got this section called operators in the inspector. There are basically four modes here and we'll take them one at a time just playing with drums for a minute. So I've got this snare and the most sound designy one of this uh, is called repeats. If I say maybe I want this nine times in the note and I can kind of see the lines within the note. Shift the timing, ramp down the velocity. Now that's kind of fun, but Again, this is happening too often. I don't really want to be dealing with one bar. I want to think in units bigger than a bar. So I'm going to go ahead and take a second operator here. This bottom one with a repeat sign uh, is recurrence. How often do I actually want this to play? So now I'm going to be counting how many times the, the, the loop actually cycles and deciding on which of those events do I actually have it trigger something or not. So here just be, oh, the first, the second, the third. I could go up to eight and then program in each of eight loops whether this individual note or piece of audio plays or not. Let's keep it simple. I'm going to go with three. So we should hear it the first time and not the second two times. Mm -hmm. And maybe this open hi-hat could benefit from something similar. OK. 
Okay. So now, if I deselect it, take a look at these notes. They look dim. Oh. And now they're happening. So there's something in the visualization already that's showing me when these are going to happen and when they're not going to happen. And for my money, when you actually get something like that where you can actually see the sound before you hear it, it feels more like an instrument. It feels more like something that you can perform with. I would humbly submit. So let's go. Oh, let's be typical. Let's splatter some hi hats. Yes. Always? No. A second operator is chance. So I can basically set a probability for each of these events individually. Uh, it's also represented down here, kind of like velocity is. So if I drag it down, now we're in like a 20% range, something like that. So one out of five times each of these notes will sound. Do they relate to each other? No. Again, I'm going to hit play. Just look at those outlines. That's something. It feels alive. I'm not trying to program these exactly. I just want them to change a little bit over time. So let's take the same notes. Maybe. Oh, no. Copy, not move. OK. So let's make them a lot more likely up here. Too likely. Bring it down a little bit. And related to operators in this idea of when things trigger, how they play, uh, we've also put in this idea called spread. So anything that's automatable inside of a clip, in this case we're just thinking velocity, that's simple. Instead of dragging it, I could alt drag it. And suddenly for each of those notes that are selected, you're seeing the bottom bottom and top range of what's actually possible. So every time the playhead passes, it will randomly pick a value inside of that range. <laughs> That's enough for me. Uh, and I'm just going to take a chance, use the same pattern, why not? and grab a slightly different operator. So the last operator, there are four modes. The fourth one is occurrence. It is simply saying, when will this note or audio play? When will it occur? Uh, and it's the easiest because it's just a flat menu. So what I'm going to do here is go with one of these bottom uh, options. It's really a performance gesture. So I'm going to say, when fill is on. What is fill? Well, it's a button up here in the transport that is global and available, and I could map it to my hardware right here now. So now, whenever this button is pressed, certain notes are going to play. We're on an alternate timeline suddenly. And when I let go, those notes won't play. Similarly, I could set other events to say, oh, well, care only play when it's off, only play when it's on, don't pay attention. Now I've got one simple way to control things and actually shift them in a different direction. Because again, when I'm performing, I'm probably going to be doing something else, so a minimal control to affect the music is kind of what I'm looking for. It's not in. I'm not pressing fill. There it is. Maybe make it a little more likely. You know, we're on a stage. Let's take all those notes. Let's just say, hey, how about the panning value for each individual note? Should also spread randomly each time. <laughs> Everyone on your iPhone at home, it is stereo, I promise. So, uh, We've got something here. We've got all of these operator modes that kind of create something irregular. If I was just looking at those first two, so, oh, every third time play this note, every fifth time play this note, this isn't a one-bar pattern. This is a 15-bar pattern. 
which is more interesting to me than a 16 or 17 bar pattern. Um, but once you add the, the randomness on top of it, the performance element, none of this is necessarily ever going to happen again. It might be completely different each and every time. Sometimes your oscillator just needs to feed into a different oscillator, needs to feed into a different oscillator, etc. So I've got a bass part here. Let's explore for a moment that last operator mode, that operate the uh, occurrence mode that we looked at briefly. Because what's interesting here is there were a lot of choices. So I've got a simple bass line, just note up, let's go, it's mono, it returns to the original note. That part's nice because Mono is fun in a way. If a note doesn't happen, the original note sustains. If a note does happen and it's short and it lets go, oh, it goes back to playing the original note. It's kind of a nice safety net for programming these things. So what I did was I took the same clip and added a little bit of an ornament onto the end of each line. So if I were to listen to all of this, it is too much. So let's just listen to it with the music. <laughs> is too much. Um, it's a little bit interesting. When I'm looking at these operators and it says when an event plays, without the operators, the events always play. So putting these in, you're really just saying things are going to happen less often, which doesn't sound that exciting until you start thinking about how you approach this as a musician. You start with a lot of ideas. And if you, if you send all the ideas out at once, if you trigger everything at once, it will sound awful. So it's an interesting way to try to teach the computer to be a little bit composerly while I'm ideally playing something else in the end. So I'm going to take this apart for a minute. I'm going to take these little ornament sections and not the first note of each one, but all the following notes. I'm going to grab them because I can put them into one simple mode. The idea of with previous. The, the part that's interesting to me with operators is giving a relationship between your actual notes or your audio. So now that these are all saying without previous, well, what's the previous? That's this note here. That's this note here. So now, if that initial note of each of those phrases happens, the following notes will also happen. They're going to be treated as a whole block. If I set this to random 20%, then you're only going to get one or two of each note playing, and that's not a phrase anymore. That's just kind of, you know, that's something lost in the transom. That's some weird transmission. So what do I want to do for triggering each of those individual ones? I could set it to a probability. I'm going to go back and use fill again. I'm going to say when the fill button is pressed, if it's held down and it makes this note happen, all the notes that come after will also happen. But if it's not, then I just don't get this little flourish, this little ornamentation. So again, I've got two knobs here, one making the bass an octave, oh, <laughs> pads, one making the bass an octave lower, one putting us in fill, and that's enough to control what's going on so far. <laughs> So 
a way to take this little thing and put more information into it, and then I get to perform and decide when it will occur. Uh, finally, what do I want to do while this is happening? Well, I have a very simple patch. It's performing like you'd kind of expect. I have pitch tracking on on the oscillator. If I were to turn it off. I have pitch tracking on the filter. So, I don't know what you do for fun. I like to play a keyboard incorrectly. So, I'm going to turn off pitch tracking on the oscillator. And I'm going to manually bring in the pitch signal and open up the attenuator, and I will hear exactly the same thing. That's what that tiny little icon is saving me from, is wiring up every oscillator with a cable and, op and using the input port. So it's working exactly the same as before, but now that it's a signal, I can process it. And I would like to process it in the simplest way possible. I'm going to grab a sample and hold module and say, when this comes in, if it was the very first gate played, let the pitch go in. But if I was already playing a note, ignore the pitch. Don't use it anymore. Because I want to play the oscillator with my first notes, and I want to play the filter with all my successive notes. And maybe that's something, if I can't reach all the notes, I've got a switch here to make the oscillator lower, to put the harmonics closer together, or to put the filter up an octave higher to hear different harmonics. And they're already on the keyboard. Because what else do you do to solo at Superbooth? Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you.